I present to you the interview series titled LGBT Rights in India. In this series, we interview individuals involved in the decriminalization of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code that made homosexuality a crime in India. This series is presented to you in collaboration between Jurist Legal News and Commentary based out of Pittsburgh, United States and Hamsafar Trust, India through the Liko Fellowship. In this episode, we interview Mr. Anish Gawande, who is currently a Rhodes Scholar at University of Oxford and is a curator and co-founder of Pinklist India. Hello, my name is Sharanam Baswani. I am an assistant editor at Jurist Legal News and Commentary. I am thrilled to be joined today by Anish Kawande. Anish Kawande is the director of the Dara Shikho Fellowship and the curator of Pinklist India. Anish graduated with a degree in comparative literature and society from Columbia University and is currently a Rhodes Scholar from India at the prestigious Oxford University studying public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. Given Anish's vast and formidable experience in journalism, public policy, and politics, we're excited to have his insight as part of our series on LGBTQIA plus rights in India. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Charanam. So, we're hoping today to hear from you a little bit on the public policy and politics angles that are involved and intertwined with the queer rights movement. And I think my first question along those lines would be that since the decriminalization of Section 377 in September 2018, we saw palpable momentum within the queer community and outside to take the cause further. Do you think that our lawmakers have fail to capitalize on that momentum and if so would you attribute it to outright hostility or would you say it's indifference so you know i think there's there's two distinct questions here one is what is the status of lgbtq plus rights after the 377 judgment which happened in 2018 and which struck down a colonial leader anti-sodomy law and then what is the status of legislative intervention on LGBTQI plus issues as a whole, right? So I think as a whole, the fight for LGBTQIA plus rights started far before the fight against 377 and continues far beyond the fight against Section 377. I think what's important to note is that there was a certain period, right, in between 2009, um, and 2013, which is when Section 377 was struck down by the Delhi High Court, when we had a similar momentum to LGBTQIA plus rights in the country, wherein there was celebration because there was a decriminalization of sodomy, and there was a sort of hope that there would be a further expansion of LGBTQIA plus rights, which didn't really pan out, right? Either legislatively or in practice. In fact, um, Professor Ramchandra Siras, who used to teach at Aligarh Muslim University, was actually forcefully outed and was driven to die by suicide because of sort of discrimination he faced in the aftermath of a positive judgment, right? So there's always been this contested relationship between legislative transformations and what the fight for LGBTQIA plus rights means on the ground. So similarly, I think the, the period after 2013, when the Supreme Court of India sort of reversed the Delhi High Court's verdict in a major setback for LGBTQI plus rights in India, putting Section 377 back on the statute books, I think the denial of rights actually propelled the queer rights movement forward in a far more profound way than a positive verdict did, right? So I think 2013 onwards, the outrage, the anger, the frustration, the disappointment, really got channeled in various ways. And for the first year or two, there was an attempt to overturn it legally. I think there were sustained attempts to see whether the court would reverse its own judgment quickly. That didn't happen. And as a response to that, you saw so many people come to the streets for a variety of pride parades, not just against the judgment, but in favor of wide-ranging change on other issues. So you had people starting to fight for uh, LGBTQIA plus rights in the corporate sector, in the workplace. You had others who were starting to do it in education. There was still some fighting in the legal arena. Others like me took up the challenge to sort of enter the world of politics. 
right? So the background of remembering like what happened before 2019 is important because there was this moment when there were uh, all engines fired, as it were, in the absence of a promise of legal recognition. What happened after the promise of legal recognition was that the celebration sometimes did prove to be a dampener in the intensity of all of these efforts. There was suddenly a, a sigh of relief that was heaved and that did lead to a sort of stalling of rights in some ways because one major legislative victory was obtained. Right, And so then there were questions as to whether the future of the fight for LGBTQI plus rights needs to take place again only through courtrooms. And I think we've seen a lot of our energy again divested towards courtrooms. As someone who, I know I'm speaking to a lawyer, but as someone who does not fundamentally believe that queer rights need to be transformed through the courtroom, I think the transformation that we're seeing right now is a seismic fundamental shift in the way we fight for LGBTQI plus rights in the country. Right? So you have one section that believes in going to the courts and the format that fight for rights takes in courtrooms is through a petition, right? You are pleading for rights. You are requesting rights. You are requesting the restoration of rights. The other part has started demanding the recognition of rights within politics, right? And that takes on a very different turn because you don't request politicians. You don't plead with politicians. You demand. It's a show of power. It's a show of strength. And that's required the building of a far more sustained movement. So if we have to see politicians take LGBTQI plus rights seriously, it requires a reorientation from a format of demands for rights, which has been through a petition, through pleading in courts, to one centered around the sort of democratic pushes for equal justice that other movements across the country have have seen, right? So the Dalit movement, the the sort of um, anti-caste movement, anti-Islamophobia movement, you've seen all of them build strong platforms to then present a demand for rights in the government and that's what the queer community needs to do now. And that's something that's going to take a while because until the queer community can build a certain level of momentum and until there is a way in which we can demonstrate not just numbers but coalitions there's very little chance that politicians are going to take queer rights seriously. Because at the end of the day, politicians have a thousand issues to care about, right? So it depends upon how much pressure you can apply and who supports the pressure that you're applying that's going to determine how seriously politicians take the question of LGBTQIA plus rights. And I can elaborate on this a little further when we go ahead. Absolutely. No, I concur with you when you say that courtrooms are perhaps not the ideal place for us to be fighting these battles because change in the real world is very far removed from what happens in a courtroom and legal mm-hmm. battles. So I think what you said about demanding the change as something that is owed to us is a nice segue into the next question, which is that ultimately the lawmakers are representatives of the people. And we currently find ourselves in the midst of an epidemic of invisibility. You know, the problem of inclusivity is something that is, it seems far-fetched to even be had in mainstream conversation. So why do you think that we are plagued by this epidemic of invisibility? And what, what do you envision um, the future of inclusivity in this country, especially in the political realm, looking like in the near future? So, you know, a lot of the conversations around uh, LGBTQIA plus rights, particularly in the corporate workplace and other spaces, have focused on representation as a solution for invisibility, right? Um, I think in the Indian context, that needs to be sort of critically interrogated. I think we are at a moment where we face two forms of invisibilization. One is a lack of representation of queer people in politics. And the second is a lack of representation of queer issues in politics, right? So the first issue, I think, requires just more active citizenry. So even with Pinkless India, our largest project has been something called Pink Sabha, which is, or the State of the Union, which is a large repository of every single statement made by every single Lok Sabha MP on LGBTQIA plus rights. 
So it's a tool to hold elected officials accountable and a repository to see what they've said over time. What this requires then for core issues to become more prominent in the political conversation is simply the need to keep bringing them up in political spaces. So for instance, politicians attending rallies, politicians attending public sabhas, politicians attending any sort of public facing events, including those involving journalists, need to start being questioned about their stance on LGBTQIA plus rights. Because for, for so many of them, we simply have no idea where they stand, right? And so there's no way to push for rights from individuals whose position is unclear. Right? So you don't know who are my allies, who are not my allies, who am I fighting against, who do I need to push further. So that's, that's one fundamental change that needs to happen. In terms of representation itself, I think the primary goal that needs to be put in place right now, which has been a long-standing demand, is reservation for trans persons in politics, right? Uh, in addition to education and other avenues as well. But um, the most marginalized within queer communities in India are trans communities. And the demand for representation for trans communities in the form of reservation is a long-standing demand that has political momentum that needs to be acknowledged and made into reality. We've already seen a lot of trans persons that actually stand for elections recently. You have Disha Pinky Sheikh, who's the spokesperson for the Vanchit Bharujan Aghadi. Uh, you've had others like Shabnam Mossi who got elected to MLA back in the 1990s as well. So there is momentum of that issue that needs to be pushed forward and concretely formalized. For other queer communities, it's a more difficult question, right? Because queerness intersects with so many other identities. So what really does queer representation look like? Right? So is queer representation only having a gay man who might be upper caste, upper class, uh, Hindu, etc.? or might be advantaged in all other ways in a position of power? Is representation ensuring that individuals across the spectrum have a chance to find a seat on the table? I think queerness requires us to demand different answers from politics of representation. Because queerness fundamentally acknowledges the splintering of identity into several unique experiences which in a, in, a, in a house of 545 members of parliament are impossible to all represent it. So in the absence of a representation that's driven by an individual being in a position of power, what is a new politics of representation that we can look to that ensures measures of accountability in which varied individuals and varied identities find justice? And I think that's an ongoing question. In a country like India, it's not just the queer community that faces this problem. Right? I think this is, problem, this is a problem that every single marginalized community faces in the country today. That how do we ensure that a multiple set of intersecting identities find representation, not just by name, but by actual sort of stakeholdings in policy formations and policy decisions in government actions. And it's something that we're going to have to figure out as we go along. And I think queerness has a unique insight into it. And I think queerness has a lot to contribute to the larger sort of fight for the rights of marginalized groups across the country today. So you mentioned that we face the challenge primarily of not knowing who our allies are and mm -hmm. holding our representatives accountable is very important in sort of overcoming this challenge. Uh, I'm very curious in knowing you worked as a political consultant for the Maharashtra Congress during the 2019 elections. So uh, what I wanted to know from you is that in engaging with leaders and representatives at the grassroots level in remote areas of the country, what was your experience of the broad sentiment towards the queer rights movement in these areas, which we don't necessarily have the opportunity of learning of learning about, given that we grew up sheltered in urban areas and speak necessarily to only those who agree with us already? So it was, <clears throat> it was an interesting experience because I'd graduated from Columbia, I had graduated with a degree in comparative literature focusing on Senegalese linguistic politics, very far removed from Indian politics or, or contemporary Indian rights movements at all, when I got an offer to come work for the 2019 elections. 
And I knew that I would be disappointed sitting in the US while the election raised on India. And it was an opportunity that I never thought would be possible after I came out in college. And so I said, well, I'm happy to come, but you have to acknowledge that I'm out and proud and I'm not willing to go back into the closet. Right? And Milan Dera, who's been a friend and a mentor ever since, um, he invited me to be a part of his campaign and the larger Maharashtra Congress campaign at the time, said, you come and I'll see who has any problem with you being gay. He's obviously been, he's an urban MP who's been quite supportive of LGBTQ plus rights since 2008. So I had that confidence to come back and work across the, the state, right? And it was, it was an eye-opening experience. I think I was uh, initially hesitant, reluctant to divulge anything about my own identity or discuss queerness. I think eventually the ways in which I engaged with it was wearing a slightly uh, a fancier kurta like this or more colorful colors in a sea of middle-aged men with white kurta pajamas and black rubber chappals. I sort of started wearing tighter pants and wearing brown oxfords and, you know, dressing in a way that that contested against some of the the forms of gender performance that I was supposed to adhere to. And honestly across the state I had I had responses that were primarily primarily curious, right? I think it was it was it was curiosity rather than repulsion that characterized a lot of those those early reactions. And I say this again as somebody who's a cisgender gay man who comes with caste and class privilege, right? So so even in these settings, I think my experiences were fundamentally different than those that others would have in my place who came from identities that face a greater degree of resistance and hostility. But at least with me, I found that there was more curiosity, there was more openness to engage. And surprisingly, in the political space itself, it was abundantly clear very quickly and this sort of was what prompted the the creation of Pinklist India to begin with that it was non-urban non-English speaking non-upper class elite MPs who were actually more likely to be supporting LGBTQIA plus rights than those who you would think came from traditionally liberal constituencies or backgrounds so an example I often like to give is that of Raju Shetty a farmer's leader from Hathakhandare who famously said to a journalist who recounted the story to me that when asked about whether he supports LGBTQI plus rights, he said, I'm a farmer's rights leader. If I don't support LGBTQI plus rights, that's hypocritical. Both are fighting for equal rights. And it was very natural and very easy. Right? It didn't need all the sort of intellectual hoops that you otherwise have to go through when you're engaging with MPs uh, who come from quote-unquote urban liberal backgrounds. And it demonstrated the power of sort of jumping across a barrier, jumping across a divide and getting change to happen in a way that it came from the most unexpected spaces. So I'd say overall, is Indian politics queer friendly? Not at all. I don't think Indian politics is accepting even of women or gender minorities yet, right? I mean, you barely see women within the cadre of any political party. You barely see um, any sort of diversion or sort of sort of deviation from a very narrow heteropatriarchal system. And that and that's something that all of us have to contend with, right? And I think that's a gradual transformation that's going to take time. But I don't think there's exceptional homophobia either. I don't think there's specifically a greater aversion to queer rights than there is to say the rights of any other minority that comes from a space of either ignorance or power or other forms of discrimination. So I think there is a space to advocate for LGBTQI plus rights that avoids or jumps over some of the sort of deep-rooted organized homophobia that exists in many other parts of the world. I think uh, it's it's reassuring really to hear that you're not you're not faced with the kind of hostility that you would ordinarily anticipate or you know that forms a part of the mainstream narrative so to hear that there is actually space for people's minds to change and hearts to open it's it's heartening to hear that and so since you bring up a uh, pink list i'd like to discuss that with you a little bit 
Uh, what I'm interested in knowing is how has Pinterest evolved from what it initially was and where do you think it's going? What does the future hold for Pinterest? So, you know, when Pinterest started off, it started off with my experiences in the campaign field and it started off from the sort of feeling I had growing up that it was impossible to be queer in Indian politics. So it came from a very personal space of being a, a platform, a, a voice for those who felt similarly to know that they could find a space in politics and they didn't need to abandon those dreams, right? And I think the way it started off was by finding who in Indian politics actually had spoken up on LGBTQ plus rights. So it was, it was geared towards listing allies and adopting a sort of sticks uh, and carrot and stick approach where we pr presented the carrot and said, well, very good. These are the people who've spoken up on LGBTQ plus rights. I think the, the critique that we got through those initial days and the response that we received from several seasoned activists, mentors, allies, um, was very instructive. And it was pointing to the danger of the appropriation of LGBTQI plus rights by those who might be regressive in other ways. Right? So what does such a platform do when it highlights the voices of an MP who might be Islamophobic or casteist or transphobic, but at the same time LGBT friendly, right? So they might be gay friendly, but transphobic and casteist and Islamophobic. What do you do in that case? How do you prevent this from becoming a space for pinkwashing the, the track record of our elected representatives? And so we move to a platform now that lists everything MPs have said, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? To fundamentally transform the lens through which we see politicians' engagement with LGBTQIA plus rights as not a favor, again, going from the no pleading for rights, but a demanding for rights framework that needs to be approached when asking for rights in the political space. So a platform where you can see the complete track record of an MP, right? To see what they've said in the past, what they have said recently, with two objectives. One is to hold them accountable to any promises they've made. We've been using this as an effective tool to push the Maharashtra government actually to set up a uh, transgender welfare board, subsidies for trans persons in the COVID-19 pandemic, and LGBT helpline. So this is a way of reminding politicians that the promises you make are promises that are recorded and can't be forgotten. And the second is to allow for people to have access to information when they approach a politician or when they ask questions of a politician in a public gathering or in any other space. The, the way in which we have been able to make limited impact is by ensuring this access to information reaches those who are normally kept out of this, right? So a great example is someone from Hyderabad, the trans woman who had not yet uh, come out of the closet or transitioned, reached out to us because she was in a government job and had been given that job because her father had passed away and there was some sort of... Um, some government provision that allowed her to get the job in his place. And she wanted to transition, but could not get leave just to transition, but could have received unpaid leave from the government if a higher level bureaucrat sanctioned that leave. Right. Now, higher level bureaucrats usually only sanction leaves when a politician tells them. To, right. So it's political pressure that is applied and uh, things usually get done in that way. So if someone knows someone knows someone, uh, and this usually becomes the way in which such administrative bureaucratic decisions unfold. Now, it's impossible to approach somebody and ask them whether they'll take your side if you don't know whether they're queer friendly or queer phobic, because it can go either way. Right? Yeah. So she reached out to us, interestingly, and we managed to find out that her local MLA was from the AIMIM, right? And the AIMIM MP from Maharashtra had actually made statements in support of trans people and had supported trans rights. Mm 
And so we reached out to the EIM, AIMIM MP in Maharashtra, who's an unlikely ally for trans rights. Right? You don't expect a sort of uh, Asaduddin Oasi led uh, what some would call a far right Islamic party to support LGBTQI plus rights under the contested definition. Um, but this MP from Maharashtra connected us to the MLA in Hyderabad, who spoke to the bureaucrat, and this leave was approved. Amazing. And those are the ways in which information is so powerful and so tightly controlled. And the access to the information in and of itself can be a major transformative change in Indian democratic, Indian democratic processes. So that's where we are now. I don't know where we'll go from here. We, yeah, but many in any to... case, we're, look, we're really looking forward to where Pink List has to go because I think that account in itself is really staggering. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So that my next question is, I've heard you talk uh, in previous interviews about Instagram amplification and that sort of, uh, you know, prodded me to ask you, what you think allies can do to support the movement and productively amplify queer voices in a manner that is respectful, tangible, but also not exhibitionist and performative in its essence? So I think this is a difficult question, right? I think allyship is a process and not a label. And I think um, it's a learning journey across the way. I think it's important to remember that good allyship requires constant and consistent listening and responding to feedback. The ways in which, so that being said, so anything, any advice I give, be prepared to change or be prepared to discard completely if in six months there is a general consensus that my, my advice has been absolutely rubbish and is going nowhere. So, you know, there are ways in which forms of allyship that are good forms of allyship right now might become bad forms of allyship just shortly after, right? So currently, I think one of the most important ways of sort of the most important ways to be a good ally is to find ways to contribute to grassroots queer fundraisers and queer organizations that are struggling in the aftermath of COVID-19, right? So on our website, we have a list of fundraisers called Queer Relief. Um, and we've been sort of pushing for grassroots organizations in various parts of the country to receive funding to support queer and trans communities in the aftermath of COVID-19. Right? So putting your money where your mouth is is always number one um, good allyship. I think in addition to that, amplification of the sort of of any sort of larger cause that that requires public support and public outrage is always important. So a good example is recently the NCERT, which is the National Council that regulates uh, educational material and textbooks, released, released a manual for medical students right, on uh, trans identities and gender nonconformity and on sensitization for medical students. Now, this was a manual that was comprehensive in scope, unprecedented in form, and incredibly powerful in its impact. And very recently, certain members of right-wing outfits uh, from the ruling party spoke out against this manual, criticized it, and said that it was created by anti-national elements. Right? And that's led to the manual actually being pulled from the NCERT website and potentially being withdrawn. At this moment, there's a need to sort of amplify voices supporting the reinstation, uh, reinstation of that manual in and of itself and also arguing against the sort of slander campaigns against queer and trans people who have been involved in drafting that manual. So when you see things like these, amplifying them and ensuring those around you hear of these issues is important because we do live in, in, in little echo chambers and bubbles where where it's hard today, right, to to know in an age of algorithms that show you what you should see or what you want to see, um, what is happening in the rest of the world. And finally, I think 
uh, forms of good allyship also involve in many ways, and not just on social media, but beyond, uh, stepping up to perform sensitization roles in your spheres of influence. And by this, I mean it could be as a teacher with your students, it could be as an individual with your family, it could be as somebody in a workplace with your colleagues, but anyone who takes your opinion seriously or values your opinion, ensuring that they become sensitized to queer issues and understand queerness and understand how to be good allies themselves is incredibly important because at the end of the day, you're only going to be able to transform slowly and it's only going to be useful when it comes from someone they trust. And so the example I always give is, I think the, 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 the biggest activist intervention I have made is sensitizing my parents. Beyond that, I think uh, the rest of the world, maybe I might end up doing it, maybe I won't, but, but the most important thing that I have managed to do is sensitize my parents because that's something that will last. That's something that's ongoing. And that's something that I can take accountability and responsibility for. Because once we put an Instagram post or a Facebook status or a tweet, we've sort of performed activism, but we're not held accountable for it. And we're not engaging in a continuous process that allows it to actually make an impact. So focusing any form of allyship on, on projects or on, on sort of items to do that are both continuous in process and also hold you accountable for the outcome of that process is incredibly important. Absolutely. I think in a country where our median age is pretty young by comparison, if we all just sensitize our parents, then that's a large chunk of the population taken care yeah. of. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I'd like your perspective on the historical, perhaps, pitfalls of the Western queer movement, how we can avoid them, and how you would contrast the challenges of the queer movement in the West with the challenges that we face here at home, especially given that you've had experience in both regions uh, participating and uh, amplifying the movement. Yes, yeah, it's a very good question. I think I want to come back to where we started off with, right? I think it's incredibly important that as we move from this transition from a petition for rights in courtrooms, which happens at the level of an individual, right? It's individual petitioners going to court to the level of a demand for rights that happens in the political arena, where it is a community that goes and fights for its rights. We've also seen the important necessity for building solidarities across various movements. I think the historical pitfall in the West of LGBTQI plus identities has been the sheer inability of queer movements in the West to ally with other movements against oppression and marginalization. I think the myopic view that queer rights are inherently separate from the fight for black lives, for the fight for sort of disabled rights, for the fight for the rights of uh, the environment as well, for instance, is something that really is a major pitfall in queer movements in the West today and something that they're paying the price for quite heavily. Right. Um, I think it's allowed for more organized homophobia to continue to exist and has done a disservice to queer people on the ground while being able to achieve, again, rights that have existed largely in courtrooms. So the way forward, at least in India, is for queer movements to ally with anti-caste movements, movements against Islamophobia, movements that fight for mental health rights, movements that fight for the rights of the differently abled, movements that fight for environmental rights, and create a broad-based coalition that can present a charter of demands in the political arena that builds upon each other, right? Because there's one thing that's easy to easy to forget, which I think the Supreme Court, in all of its wisdom in 2013, in delivering the regressive judgment that it did on Section 377, uh, mentioned quite accurately that LGBT people are a minuscule minority. Right? And we might disagree with the statement that a lot of people might not be out, but the reality is the number of out people in India is a minuscule minority. 
And when you're fighting for rights from the position of a minuscule minority, or when you're fighting for rights from a place wherein you have not been able to create the conditions necessary for people to be able to come out and advocate for their own rights, you have to be able to build coalitions. You have to ally with other movements that do have larger, more sort of established chunks of support. And none of these movements individually, by the way, are, are large. Right? They all exist in echo chambers. And they all have their individual echo chambers, right? But the, the challenge is to keep those echo chambers alive in a way that also allows them to speak to each other. Because these echo chambers individually can be ignored, but when they start speaking to each other, their cumulative impact is one that can never be sort of dismissed. And finally, I just want to add a, a little bit is that India has had a very different trajectory for LGBTQIA plus rights, right? So you've seen someone like Ambedkar who defended R.D. Karve in the 1930s who published uh, in a magazine in India articles on sort of birth control and homosexuality and other issues. And Ambedkar, of course, went on to become the founding father of India's constitution and a major leader for Dalit rights in the country in a way that demonstrates that different minorities in the country, including the queer minorities, have always existed side by side and collaborated with each other. In a similar way, it was Namdev Dhasar, who was one of the Dalit Panthers, uh, who led a march for providing ration cards to sex workers and trans persons in the late 1980s and early 1990s, which was, again, a demonstration of different minorities fighting for each other's rights. The history of the fight against 377 as well, which was led by ABVA, has been instrumentally guided and directed by close collaborations with the feminist movement, which was incredibly important in highlighting LGBTQI plus rights in the rise of AIDS in the country. Right? So India has always had a trajectory wherein we fundamentally built our queer movements in conversation with, in collaboration with, in, in, in solidarity with other movements. And to forget that now and to presume that LGBTQIA plus rights are separate, distinct, individual entity would be the greatest disservice we can do and would be jumping into the same pitfalls the West has made. Not so far ago. Not so long ago. Absolutely. So definitely the focus has to be on intersectionality and taking it forward mm -hmm. from there. So I think my next question is, as someone who is part of a rare breed, actually, someone who's out and proud in Indian politics, how does a path for younger professionals who aspire to perhaps mirror your journey or emulate your journey in some way look like? You know, do you have any advice for them? And what are some of the mistakes that they can avoid? Advice? Dear way. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's, I think it's, 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 it's a, I keep running away, right? I think the, the reality is that it's, it's very nice for me to speak about these issues sitting nicely in Oxford right now and waxing eloquent. But uh, if you ask me the same question two years ago, you'd probably get very different answers about the frustrations I have with the process, right? And it's Indian politics as a whole is messy, is inaccessible, is built to keep outsiders out and is designed in a way that does not encourage any form of true democratic participation, right? So your first hurdle is getting through all of that and understanding the ways in which Indian politics is designed in a way that retains power in the hands of the few at the cost of the many. Keeping that in mind, I think the, the most effective way of understanding Indian politics and therefore finding your way into it is one, getting involved in any activist movements across the country. The second is to truly build support at a grassroots level. And this is something I've said time and again. I, I sort of ran two campaigns for a member of parliament. I did the sort of state level campaign again for the national parliamentary elections. And the one thing that became abundantly clear is that for young people who want to enter politics, and I hope that we get better MPs as well, but the way to begin for young people is at the local level. Because I don't think we need better MPs. I don't think we need better MLAs. 
I think we need better cooperators. I think we need better municipal uh, uh, councillors. I think we need better local representatives, right? Who are going to operate at a level where they can actually make a difference in changing hearts and minds, and also at a level where they can actually make a tangible difference to the communities that they represent. We forget very often that a single Indian MP represents almost six million people. That's the size of most countries. Right? It's impossible for a single person, when elected by those many people and when accounting for the considerations of so many people, to make any real impact. Quite honestly, because as an MP, then you're doing everything from fixing potholes and worrying about. Uh, Electricity shortages to then having to discuss farm laws in Parliament. Right. So, so the the level of an MP, I think your ability to make an impact is is far more limited for me in some ways. And so, focusing at the grassroots level, trying to find ways to integrate yourselves into a community, trying to become a leader within your own space rather than aspiring to sort of become the face for something. Is important. What's there? What's so you know? A lot of people have approached me very recently because I think there's a there's an urge now for people to get involved in politics, and and they're very popular on Instagram, or they're very popular on YouTube, and they have like a million followers or four million followers. And then the problem is when it comes down to it, right? Electoral politics, and I and I can't speak so much for other forms of politics. I'm I'm not someone who can. Tell you best how to advance in a party or become a spokesperson or or sort of advance in those ways. But if you want to get in, involved and invested in electoral politics, you have to remember that the first thing you learn is geography. Right. First thing you remember is you can have four million followers, but if sixty thousand of them aren't in one area and can't vote for you, then it's pointless. If you have six million followers spread across five hundred forty-five constituencies in one country, then Wherever you run for an election, you're going to get around three thousand to ten thousand votes, and you're going to lose miserably. So your 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 most famous actor, your most famous、um, YouTube celebrity or Instagram superstar, is not as important or as relevant as your local trade union leader or as the person who's sort of involved in doing COVID relief in your area, right? So keeping that in mind, building networks within your community is incredibly important. And politics will find its way. Politics will find its way of coming to you. The minute you become a leader, I'll tell you, I've managed again in these campaigns that I've never reached out to anyone who is popular on Twitter or Instagram. But the number of people I've reached out to who are part of like their Rotary Club or who are part of、um, leading some sort of like. After school, at night education program, or who are young community leaders who are doing sports initiatives in their communities, is far far more significant. And those are the people that political parties will reach out to. Those are the people who will be invited to contest elections. Those are the people that politicians will come to for assistance during an election. And so, if you are one of those people, politics will come to you instead of the other way around. Because the other way around is. Almost impossible and incredibly difficult in the Indian political space today. Absolutely, I think yours is a, an extremely pragmatic approach. People tend to think of politi- politics as a very、uh, fanciful game, but I think it comes down to territorially concentrated support. So、mm-hmm. that is great insight for anyone who is interested in pursuing this field. I think we're nearing the end of our conversation. So, as a parting takeaway,、uh, I'd like to know from you how important do you think dialogue and discussion are as tools to change the minds of those who are diametrically opposed to causes that we want to support? And more importantly, how do you win an argument, especially when you're speaking about the rights of marginalized communities? Without alienating or losing the person that you're trying to persuade, you know this is、uh, in in school, and then for a little bit in college, I used to be a debater, and I've given up on debating, and, and I'm now a vociferous anti-debater because I think it's fundamentally a question of knowing how to speak when people will listen. Right? I think it's quite pointless, for instance. 
to engage in a dialogue where you know that it's going to only lead to a divergence of opinion. Right. Um, and it's very important to also acknowledge when this dialogue is happening for performative reasons. I'll give you a great example that came up recently as well. So it's, I uh, can't believe it happened very recently, but the National Human Rights Commission in India organized a debate on are human rights an impediment to national security? Now that's a fundamentally ridiculous debate to have because arguably that's one way of convincing people who might be diametrically opposed to you. But in another sense, it's giving a platform to views that should be unacceptable to begin with, that even if human rights are an impediment to national security, that does not mean you violate human rights, right? So there is an argument that human rights are inviolable. Uh, and the second point is the, the format in which this conversation takes place necessarily believes that both sides are equal and both sides have a valid argument. So one way in which you convince those who are diametrically opposed to you is by refusing to participate in a platform that gives equal weight to two sides of an argument because that's never going to work in your favor and that's never going to be helpful or productive for anything you firmly believe in. The second thing, again, is I think in an age of social media, in an age of Twitter amplification, uh, in an age of virality, people often believe that the best way to make an impact is by being the loudest voice in the room, by reaching out to the most number of people, by having the most views on a particular video, but we're a country of 1.2 billion people. You know, someone tells me they got 60,000 retweets and a tweet, and I say, so what? There's definitely going to be 60,000 people who agree with you in a country of 1.2 billion people. That's not an achievement. That's not something surprising. That's not something that I'm ever going to be impressed by. If at the end of the day, again, those in your family don't agree with you, right? You know, you could be the most influential speaker and I said, I said this for a lot of party spokespersons and various political parties I've worked with that they're very good at giving long speeches on national television, but if they came under their own building and started speaking, their own neighbors would not want to listen to them. Right. And so at the end of the day, if you truly want to change opinions, you need to focus on a small set of people around you who value your opinion. And you need to also acknowledge continuously that nobody is going to take you seriously unless you've proven that you care beyond the sake of making a point. Right? I think very often everyone who sort of, and this is again comes from a debating impulse, right? everyone is very keen to make a point and have an opinion on every issue. Sometimes just because you can say something doesn't mean you should say it. You need to choose your battles carefully and demonstrate that you are a voice that can be trusted. I think the number of people whose opinions have changed after the relief work we did in the aftermath of COVID on something as simple as politics, and let's just take politics, convincing them that the party in power is not worth voting for. Lots of people I've spoken to fundamentally disagree with me, would never want to engage with me. After the relief work that we did during COVID, when they saw that it's not all talk, that you're not opposing somebody for the sake of opposing them, but because you truly care and because you truly want to see change, that's when they'll take you more seriously and at least start listening. So the first step to start getting someone to listen to you is to start doing something that will allow them to see that you care. And in the absence of that, I think hot air is cheap and talking is not going to get us anywhere, at least in this, in this age where there's so much that needs to be done. Absolutely. Changing, changing minds and having these conversations. I think it takes a lot of character building, a lot of work that you put in behind the scenes to really, you know, have weight behind anything that you say. So that is continuous and it's accountable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And like you mentioned earlier, putting your money where your mouth is, is really important if you're going to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So as my last question, can you give our viewers some book recommendations? Oof. You know, this is a very difficult question. I'm actually only going to give one book recommendation because okay. I think it's it's one that I've read that's quite beautiful and I think it really 
encompasses a lot of what we need to be reading right now. It's um, Loving Women by Maya Sharma. And Maya is a trade union activist and queer activist based in Gujarat. And she writes about the everyday experiences of queerness in rural Gujarat and the ways in which queerness exists alongside so many beliefs, practices, traditions, customs, and the ways in which um, it is simultaneously accepted, rejected, uh, contested against, and gives us a more authentic and real picture about queerness that goes away from this narrative, which is very common, which we hear all the time, which is the one that I love to refute all the time, that you know, before the British came, India was LGBT friendly, which is rubbish. Um, and, and instead moves towards a framework that says queerness always exists in some form of tension with society. And sexuality always exists in some form of tension with society. In the same way that the patriarchy has always existed, queerphobia has always existed. And are we ever going to see a day when it's completely eliminated? I don't know and I don't think so. But are we going to see a way in which it's negotiated in different ways and reaches a better solution? Yes. And does that solution always need to be through a rights-based framework, through courtrooms, through a self-labeling as gay or lesbian, or through some form of um, some form of sensitization that happens through TV or textbooks or Bollywood? Not really. And I think the, the 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 lesson that that book leaves you with and it's a collection of stories so everyone can sort of access it quite easily and it's it's delightful to read uh is that queerness comes in many forms and acceptance comes in many forms and to truly be able to fight for lgbtqia plus rights is to understand the diversity of queerness and to reject any sort of narratives that seek to carve out a unified theory of queer movement queer accept- acceptance uh queer phobia at all that's my that's my book Maya Sharma's Loving Women all right thank you so much Anish we are absolutely thrilled that you were able to join us today and give us all of your wonderful insights and um, I hope that we can speak to you soon in the future again absolutely thank you so much Sharnam for such a wonderful chat and I look forward to meeting you soon